We will let the orphanage deal with you. No, I don't belong there. Where do you belong then? A child has to belong to somewhere. When I read the book and looked at the illustrations, I'm like, wait a minute, this is a kid's story that's also a tribute to cinema. Who better to do that than Martin Scorsese? Action! Just working with Martin Scorsese is an experience. I'll help you if I can. He tells me so much, you know, he's a phenomenal director. How did you two rats get in here? It's been the experience of a lifetime. Who gets to work with Martin Scorsese and be the main character? Hugo. It's big, it's massive, and completely different from what most 13-year-old kids would do. My little bitch. It's really hard, but it is so worth it. I guess if you actually started to think what was involved in making a movie of this kind, you would never venture forth. Because it's too insane, too crazy. Working with the children, dogs, <laughs> sets being built constantly, the interiors of the clocks, the 3D. All of these things contributed to a feeling of an enormous undertaking but it was, it was kind of fun that way. What is that? It's an automaton. Why would my key fit into your father's machine? Someone in my company found the book about five, six years ago. And I had in the back of my head that Marty always wanted to do a kids' movie. So I sent the book to Marty and I said, I think we found your so-called kids' movie. It was one of those experiences. I sat down and read the thing completely straight through. There was an immediate connection to the story, the boy, the boy's loneliness, uh, his association with the cinema, the association with the machinery of creativity. When I found out that Martin Scorsese was interested in making it into a movie, immediately I was like, oh, of course, it has to be Martin Scorsese. It's the eternal myth of the lost man, guided back into life by the hands of a child. That is an absolutely classic piece of mythology. For me, this has a very uh, interestingly personal connection, you know, and just happened to hit at the right time. I have a young daughter who will be 12 soon. He is the youngest daughter, Francesca. She hasn't been able to see his films. So he was like, I'm going to make a film that my daughter can actually watch, you know? Reading to children, introducing them to music of different kinds, films, ballet. It's like rediscovering all of these wonderful art forms again, but through the eyes of, of children. Marty called me one day and said, uh, I want you to read this book. And I said, OK. And he says, it's a kid's book. I was like, oh, Marty, I don't know. I'm not a kid's writer, per se. He said, just read the book. Read the book. So this book shows up in my mailbox. And you know, Brian Selznick's book is like, it's like a brick. It's this huge book. And I was thinking, you know, what did Marty send me? And I started reading it. And within five pages, I knew why he loved it. And I knew I had to do it. I was so impressed by the screenplay. I think everybody was. Because it, it was true to the book. But I could actually see it. I could visualize it. It was very vivid. And it was a very, very moving story. What Brian Selznick has done is write a great modern Dickensian novel about an orphan search for home. I was inspired to write The Invention of Hugo Cabret when I first saw A Trip to the Moon by George Melies. And it sort of stuck in the back of my head for a really long time. And I thought I'd like to make a story about a boy who meets the man who made that movie. With a lot of books, you know, you kind of get the basic plot line, but then you have to embrace on certain areas, and that's really what we did. The story needed to be streamlined to a certain extent, so elements were dropped from the book. But we're finding that certain images are so strong and certain scenes cover so much territory that it has the resonance, I think, of the book. Everything really revolves around Hugo, of course, and so uh, Ellen Lewis, who cast the film, uh, went to England. She checked many of the uh, acting schools, etc. And she brought about three boys back here. Asa looked right when he walked in, and then he read two of the scenes. And I was convinced. I knew who he was, but I hadn't seen any of his films, because most of them are 18s. And my mum told me that he's the best director ever. And then, so I slowly began to realize how big this actually was. And he, he is. He is the best director. What's your name, boy? M Hugo. Hugo Cabret. Stay away from me, Hugo Cabret. Since Anne Frank, Aza, he is the greatest 
child actor I've had the privilege of working with. And we can forget the word child, actually. He's a great actor. And then we had Asa read with two or three young actresses. They were matching him up with Chloe and seeing the chemistry there, and it was phenomenal. It was a really cool kind of turn of events because I showed up in New York and I was meeting Martin Scorsese for this phenomenal role and I went and I met him and he was just really warm, you know, and he told me a bunch of stories and I was like, wow, you know, he's, he's a really cool guy. Why are you helping me? Because this might be an adventure. Chloe is a month older than me, so we get, we get on well because the characters are quite close. It's sort of a brother-sister relationship between me and her. The two looked right together and also sounded right and played off each other very well. Very different kinds of personalities, too. Very different. And they were the age of my daughter. So it was an extension of what I'm doing at home. <laughs> so I felt very comfortable with it. Really very comfortable with it. Marley is so open with collaboration, and that's why actors love to work with him so much. He makes everyone feel so comfortable. There's a huge amount to learn with Marty. You feel that you're with a filmmaker taking first steps in something, whatever it is. He's doing something for the first time. When we looked at the image of George Melies, there was no doubt in my mind that, really, the look would be perfect with Ben. As soon as he came on set, we literally were dealing with George Melies. Ben worked out a, a way of moving a defeated posture, in a way of a man who was so alive, making 500 films, continually creating a whole new art form, is suddenly loses all his money, has to burn every day, and then finally is uh, sitting behind the counter of a toy store. The casting is quite extraordinary in this film, and absolutely dead right. But you would expect that from a director like Martin Scorsese. John Logan, in the script, was able to create a little world of the train station. We tried to do these vignettes with a very light touch. When we shot them, it was almost like shooting a silent film. It wasn't even important to hear the dialogue, it was just to see them and to have these little running stories. Once I realized we were going to be centered in London and be able to employ the great sort of variety of stage actors that exist in London, it, it became doubly exciting. Monsieur Freak, Richard Griffiths at the news kiosk, Madame Emily, Francis de la Tour has her cafe, which has music in it. it. Happens to be that Django Reinhardt is in the band, if you noticed. And also, if you look closely, there's James Joyce and Salvador Dali outside at the table when the boy's being chased. And then there's Lizette. Emily Mortimer taking care of the flower shop. Oh. And of course, Monsieur Labis, who runs the bookstore, played by the great Christopher Lee. Oh, Isabel. May I present to you Monsieur Hugo Cabray? I always felt that my career would not be absolutely complete unless I did a film with Martin Scorsese. And so all these characters were meant to sort of weave in and out of the picture. Give me your best smile. John Logan asked Brian Selzik if we could open up the character of the station inspector because I wanted to have a little more flavor and more levels to him. And so I thought by working with Sasha, Baron Cohen, we could find that. Are they smelly? Are they smelly flowers? Oh, um, yes, a little. I met Marty and I said, all right, set in 1931, perhaps there's some kind of war injury. And originally my character was gonna have a false leg. And the idea was in the first chase that I'd run and then suddenly a trolley would hit my leg and then my false leg would fly out into the audience. But then we realized that actually the kids would be freaked out by that. So in the end, we kind of came up with this idea of a leg brace. It makes him more sinister, but also slightly more sympathetic. So it's an interesting challenge. That is straight to the orphanage with you. I always pointed out that, let's say you put in jail one day, and the policeman and the, the judge, they're really very funny, but you're still in jail. <laughs> you're still in jail. <laughs> you know, I don't care how funny they are. <laughs> so taking that, uh, we try to create a balance with uh, humor 
to the character of the station inspector. Still as a threat, though. Still as a person who's closed off, in a way, because of his experience in the war. The reason I'm doing this is because it's Martin School Science Day, and I think probably every actor in the world, if they had the opportunity, would say, all right, I'll do a Marty film. He's got an incredible eye for detail. He understands performance. He has a brilliant way of working with actors, of making them feel relaxed, and of encouraging their ideas and making it feel like a collaboration. And visually, he's the master. All his movies have a unique signature. I'm still, after my fourth movie, on set with him, watching him move that camera and watching the way he works with the talent and the way he picks out the angles to his shots. And I'm still, I still sit there and wow, this is Martin Scorsese. So even after 12 years, for me, it's new every movie and every time, the way he tells a story. This was breaking ground for him, working with kids, 3D and dogs. If he is deceased, then who has been winding the clocks? <laughs> yes, I'm guilty. I added dogs to the story because I was thinking I want to make the station inspector one of those iconographic figures. You just see his silhouette and you know who he is. And I thought, give him a big dog. Give him a Doberman Pinscher, the scariest dog I could imagine. Blackie, Enzo, and Borsellino. Three Dobermans. And I said, it sounds like a gangster film. I said, <laughs> <laughs> Then there were a couple of dachshunds. I think he was taken by surprise. He hasn't had a lot of experience with, with dog's character, per se. It really is basically like working with a two to a three-year-old. Watching Marty direct a dog for six hours. <laughs> yeah, my producer's sitting there going, oh my god, what are we doing? And Datsuns are running around. And they just didn't want to work. They would show up and they were like, no, not today. We're not doing this today. Mathilde pointed out that the dachshunds have their own attitude about everything. They're not impressed. And so the dachshunds we found to be uh, resistant. I don't think they're too happy about acting. <laughs> I don't think they've read the script. They're just sweet little things that run around and get distracted. Just clapping noises and all the extras are there. Babies, they're great. They are sort of run around, slipping on the marble floor. They go, speak, and they just start barking. It's quite terrifying. Sasha has been absolutely amazing, really a team player, and that's what we need. He doesn't have a dog in real life, but he's been really helping us out in, in so many ways. This is an extreme complex movie. We have a lot of elements that comes into place. You have a live animal in a 3D environment, which has not been done before. By the time we all decided that we can make the film, immediately people started talking about 3D. And I saw Avatar and I saw a number of other films, a beautiful use of 3D. I thought, really, on that level, it's extraordinary. Bob Richardson been on camera. And Richardson, I worked with on Casino, Bringing Out the Dead, The Aviator, and Shutter Island. And uh, he's a wonderful artist, and he had never done 3D. And so we looked at each other and kind of pushed each other a little bit and knew we wanted to try it, you know? So he was discovering, too, as he went along. I actually was about 12 or 13 years old, formative years going to movies, where practically every film was made in 3D at that time. It was 1953. And the first one I saw was The House of Wax. It's probably the best 3D film ever made directed by Andre de Toth. Of course, he had one eye. He had a patch on his eye. I saw them all. I had the jewelry, Man in the Dark. We went to all of them. In Manhattan, uh, Marty rented a little movie theater, and we watched his private prints of Dial M for Murder and House of Wax that he owns, and they're 3D prints. It's like, well, you know, where'd you get these? And he was a, essentially a collector of this sort of 3D material. He was always fascinated by it. So when this opportunity came up, to tell this story at this particular time in 3D, it was an opportunity that I guess he couldn't pass up. We see in 3D, we see in space, most of us do. Space is part of our lives, it means something. I think for the individual person who has a vision of telling a story through images, how that person uses space, that extra element, that extra dimension, to tell a story is very, very important. When somebody is, you know, incredible as Marty is, the 3D is not a gimmick in the, in the telling of the movie. It's part of the fabric of the storytelling. 
Shooting in 3D is far from easy because of the technical processes involved. Each shot was like rediscovering the quality of the image, the movement, what movement does to the 3D, and what 3D does to the movement, you see, it all changes. What I discovered working with the 3D was with the right performances and the right moves, it enhances the actor. It's almost as if it's uh, a mixture of theater and film. Monsieur Claude, was that you? Are you drunk? We're sort of experimenting where the physical comedy works in 3D and how it changes that. The film's set in 1931, and what me and Marty decided is to slightly pay an homage to some of the 30s comedians. We kind of decided that if Keaton and Chapman were around today, they'd try and do their routines in 3D, because what it provides is an extra depth to the joke. And action! And so somebody tripping up and smashing their leg through a double bass might be slightly funnier in 3D. Basically, you can turn the 3D up and you can turn the 3D down. So in scenes where they want like the dog to be in your face and like drooling on your face, they turn it up really, you know, high. But when you're doing like a crying scene, they just they turn it up just enough to where it looks like your, you know, your orchestra seats at a play. You know, where you can see the definition in the actor's face. It's so clear. But with the 3D, it just adds this other element that you're so woven into the blanket of the film. Every shot we did was really uh, learning all over again, constantly, because of the element of depth and because of the nature of the sets, the train station, the Melier studio, all of these things together create a little microcosm of a child's world. Where do you live? There. When you do a Scorsese movie, you create everything to a T. So we built everything. The detail is unbelievable. There's no one better than Dante Ferretti to create the world with something like this. This is the train station of Paris, the Gare de Montparnasse. This is spread out in two, three different stages because otherwise we don't have enough room. I've never had an experience walking into a set that awe-inspiring in terms of the detail and the scope and the grandeur of it. I think Dante's work is like an old world craftsman. The clocks, I mean, <laughs> talking about taking them to another level, you know, we had a huge clock on one set, and I walked in and I couldn't believe the size of this thing. And all these extraordinary gears and, and wheels and flywheels and this sort of thing, all moving, which are based on the real clocks. And it's the one that Hugo's hanging from. They're not CGI'd, it was all built. The way Marty and I always talked about it is we wanted the machines in the movie to be magical. We wanted to look at the gears and the levers and the springs and the coils as being something magnificent, as being something so unique and rare. And when you see the way Bob Richardson shot those things, you realize they do look magical. Film is magic. Every great director is a magician. Every great actor or actress is a magician. Sometimes I try to explain to children around me, I said, no, we're just playing. We're doing exactly what you do. We make up a game, and then we try to put it on film or digital or whatever, but we're all playing together. It was an enormous undertaking, but it was like a celebration for all of us.